First John and chapter 3. We will read those words found in verse 16 down to verse 18. First John chapter 3 from verse 16 down to verse 18. The Bible reads, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. We're continuing our series of sermons in 1 John, and the theme that we are dealing with is essentially assurance of eternal salvation. And we continue emphasizing that this is an extremely important issue. You don't postpone the issue of knowing whether you are saved or you are not. In many ways, it is like uh, feeling unwell, which is what we all are. We are all spiritually uh, unwell. We need salvation to make us whole. And for a person who is feeling unwell, you, you don't postpone seeing a doctor. You, you deal with the matter urgently. Because if you postpone seeing a doctor, you're not getting any better. In fact, you're getting worse. And in due season, perhaps by the time you go to see the doctor, the doctor will be saying to you, sorry, it's too late. There's nothing we can do for you. The illness has reached terminal stage. You better simply uh, prepare for your departure. Had you come earlier, perhaps there would have been hope. But in this particular case, the, what makes it even more urgent is the fact that when you finally die and you go to the other side, you have an eternal existence. And that existence is either going to be in the presence of God, rejoicing forever, basking, as it were, in uh, the sunshine of his love, or you will be in hell forever, paying for your sins in the flames of the lake of fire. So surely it is vital that you make sure that now you are a child of God. And the Bible, in the wisdom of God, contains an entire book, 1 John, that deals with the subject of assurance of salvation. Surely you will want to make sure that you, you put things right with God and know that things are right with God. Because imagine showing up before God and claiming ignorance and being told, you know what, I provided an entire book to deal with this situation. You can't now be showing up saying you were not sure you had the means. I ensured you had the means. We've noticed that from verse 11 of chapter 3, right up to where we are, uh, John is dealing with love as a test of salvation. That, and that love is primarily love of the believers, love of the, the people of God, love of those who belong to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what the point is making there is that if you don't love the people of God, it's because you are not yet saved, you are not a child of God. If you love them, this is one evidence. It's not the only evidence, it is one evidence that you are truly a child of God. Now, just in case individuals do uh, what we, we know best, and that is to, to ask tricky questions. Uh, how do you know whether you are loving or you are not? John, in chapter 3, verse 16, begins to, sorry, chapter 
Yes, chapter 3, verse 16, gives us something of how we can know what true love is and what we, how we can know that what true hate is. And love is what we saw last time. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and therefore we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Okay, so we have this example. We can see and say, wow, so this is what love is. Therefore, this is what I also should be doing. If I'm failing to do that, then clearly I don't love. Now he deals with hatred. What is hatred? The other side of the coin. And this time, hatred is not so much modeled in the example of Jesus. A hatred is something that we, we see in ourselves all the time. And this is the way he puts it in verse 17, where we are looking. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, it does not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. You see, what, what John is doing here is, is not simply showing us the absence of love. He is showing us what hatred is. Because remember, in the previous verses, that's what he's been doing. He says there, verse 14 and verse 15, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. In the mind of John, you either love the brethren, and consequently it's proof you are saved, or you don't love, and consequently you hate the brethren, and you are dead. There's no middle ground. So what we've seen thus far is love, clearly modeled in Jesus, and now we are seeing the lack of love, which is hatred, which we see often in ourselves. Our tendency often is to look at hatred in its extreme. We, we, we think we hate somebody only if we've taken a screwdriver and put it through their ribs. We say, yeah, that's hatred. Or if we've put poison in their tea, we say that is hatred. But we forget that that's the extreme, the extreme end of the stick. There is another end of hatred and it is where a person is in need, you can see they are in need, and you hold back that which you can help them with. And that's what we are seeing here in this passage of Scripture. We, we, we need to, to search ourselves instead of justifying ourselves by the fact that at least I am not that bad. Yes, but you could still be bad only that you haven't reached those levels yet. So what are we learning from uh, verse 16 down to verse 18? Well, first of all, it is that God often gives us situations where we can help others. And then he also brings those others to us for help. God often does this. He gives us situations where we can help others, and he brings the needy to us. And this is the situation that John envisages in our text. Verse 17a says, the first part of verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need. When anyone has the world's goods, and sees his brother in need. It is a situation that we are often in. The first part of it is something no, none of us should ever doubt, and it is this, 
we all have something of the world's good. We all do. For instance, we have food. I doubt that there's somebody here who doesn't have what they will eat for lunch today. We all have food. In fact, some of us, we've stored up so much food that if there was a nuclear warfare, for the next two months, we'll still be eating. We have clothing. Again, the same thing. I doubt that anybody here has come with their last clothing. They have no other clothing they can put on. Some of us, our wardrobes are so full that we've had to put extra clothing in suitcases. And it is the kind of clothing we put on when it is going to be another season. Hot season, we take out from our suitcases. When it's cold season, we take out others from suitcases, and so on. Again, we have a house. It's a world, it's good. And again, our homes, yeah, I suppose some of us may be uh, in homes where there's no longer space. We have filled every centimeter and every inch of it. But most of us have space, extra space in our home. There's an extra bed, there is an extra seat, there is extra this, extra that. We do have the world's good. We also have money. I doubt that what you put in the offering bag this morning was the last, 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 like the widow and her mite in the Bible, putting in the very last. We all have money. Well, maybe not all of us, but most of us do. We have transport. There was once when I wasn't preaching and I went outside to count the number of cars. I was shocked on that Sunday. There were no less than 80 cars, 8-0, parked outside. Wow. 8 times 5 is approximately 400. So if every car was completely full, then yes, all of us here would have come in those cars because it is 400 plus. So we all have something of the world's goods. I could add a few more things, but I thought at least I could cover a few such examples. We often don't want to think about this because the way we are as human beings is that our minds are, are captured by what we don't have. We are constantly thinking of what we don't have that there is this which I must now get and the other which I must now get. And we often lose sight of the fact that we already have something of the world's goods. Now, the second half of this phrase is what God brings our way often as we mingle with others in the church. John is picturing a situation where a person's needs, the person that you have seen, that you, you, you are able to mingle with in a context like this, is a person who has a need, and it is a need you can actually meet because of your world's goods. He says that, but if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, sees his brother in need. It could simply be an issue of a meal. It could be an issue of clothing. It could be an issue of a roof over one's head. It could be an issue of transport, going from point A to point B. It could be an issue of simply money. And consequently, you see that this person is in need. 
Notice the verse is not saying that if anyone has the world's goods and his brother in need asks him. There's no asking here. It is that providence is making you aware that this person has a need. For instance, it might be that the person comes to church dressed in the same things every week. They are not asking you for clothing. Our normal tendency is to start turning them into a point for gossip. Have you noticed? Eh? He, he always comes in that brown trousers. Have you noticed? Check even last weekend with the brown. And so you do. <laughs> you are right. Brown trousers everywhere. But that's all you do. You, you notice. He's not asked, but you've noticed. Or perhaps you've noticed that that brother or so spits dust. You know, it's, in other words, it's sort of finally open. It's given way. Its retirement is long overdue. And all you're doing again is cracking jokes about uh, the shoes that spit dust. So the person is not asking, but clearly they are in need. And God brings it to your attention. You see it, you are aware, you hear about it. The question is, isn't this what happens to us all the time? Isn't it? A am I the only one to whom this happens? Or does it happen to you as well? Where every so often, In God's providence, I become aware of a person's needs either through my sight because I've seen it or through my ears because someone has talked about it. And my mind makes a quick line either to my car or to my bank account or to my home or to my something which I have. Does that ever happen to you? Does it? Well, what we are learning here is that hatred as a sin of omission is when this happens and you know you can help and then you decide, I won't. No, 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 no. Leave my bank account alone. No, 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 not my car. No, 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 no. That's what he's saying here. Listen to this. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? And again, as I was saying, we, this, God does this. He has blessed us with something, and then he brings individuals in our lives. And we can see that that which I have is what would make their lives better. And we begin going through that process of should I or shouldn't I? Should I give? Or should I not give? And what he is saying is this. That if your response is no. No. After all, we are 400 church members plus here. So why should I make it a personal matter for me? Why? Others can also, can also help. There are many of us. Others, in fact, I know that one who has more wealth than me. I know this other one who has a bigger house than me. I know this other one who, you know, has more space in their car than me. I know this other one who, you know, you're sort of passing it on to everybody else. You close your heart. John is saying, it simply means you hate that brother. You hate that sister. You do. They are in need. 
God has given you the capacity to meet that need and you say no. Let other people do it. Here's John's question. Then how can you be claiming to be saved? Because if you are saved, what you are saying is that God's love of God himself resides in you by his spirit. Therefore, his love resides in you by his spirit. Is that the way God is? Is God one who shuts his heart away from you in terms of your need? Is that God's response? Or is that a response of a fallen nature? A devilish nature? How can you say the love of God dwells in you? How? We know how God responded to our need of salvation, don't we? We do. By this we know that, we know love, that he laid down his life for us. We know that. We were the ones who were in need. Our sins had caused God's wrath to be hanging over our heads awaiting death and consequently hell. What did he do? He gave his son. And it was a painful sacrifice in order to change our situation. That's the kind of God who is there. So, if that's the kind of God who is there, and you are claiming it now resides in your heart, how come you are so selfish, so self-centered, that even when you have the means, and you can see a brother or sister in need, you still shut your heart. How can you claim that? Here you are in a situation. Let's turn the table around. Where you are in desperate need. You've got to pay your exam fees. You've got to pay them. And you know you cannot afford it at all. And you know that the person you who knows you, knows what that need is. And then they are spending their money on luxury. And you know that. It's luxury. Maybe they're even planning a, a holiday to the Bahamas. I know what's going on in your heart. And I'll tell you, you are saying something like this. This man hates me. I'm not just saying he doesn't love me. He hates me. How can he see me in this need and still brazen facedly? In other words, with no sign of, of, of real anxiety and concern simply continue with his agenda. This person hates me. They want to see me rule. What could God be saying about us? About you as an individual? In terms of the many needs that surround you within the body of Christ. Because remember, this is being tested within the context of people that claim to be believers. You see your brother in need. 
which is a generic term that includes your sister in it. You see. And then you simply say, I'm continuing with my plan A. Continuing with the way I live, as if this person doesn't exist with all their needs in front of me. What could God be saying about you? Could he be saying, it makes sense, after all, I've never saved you. If I had saved you, then I would be saying, how come? But because I've never really saved you, you're still dead in your sins, it makes sense that you are absolutely unmoved by the needs of others. You simply continue plan B. Rather with your plan A. Now this is the way that John concludes. This with an appeal. And we need to realize that love is not in mere feelings. It's not even in mere words. Love is in practice. Love is in reality. Love is in concrete terms. In other words, if I was to distribute papers in here to each church member and then put it this way, put down the names of church members who love you, I want to assure you they will not put down on that piece of paper people who feel love towards them, full stop. They've got no discernment for that. They won't even put down on that piece of paper people who simply say, which I'll come to in a moment, I'll pray for you. When they know those people can actually do more than pray. They'll put down on paper those who have loved in practice. Those who have loved in concrete terms. Those who have loved in reality. And this is the appeal that John ends with in our text. Verse 18. Verse 18. Little children, let us not love in word or talk but in deed and in truth. And when he uses the word little children there, he does, he's not talking to the guys who sort of feel this first and second pew this side, my closest friends in the church. He's not really thinking about them. It's a phrase of endearment. It's a phrase of love that he's using here. It's as though John is, as it were, opening his bowels of affections towards us and, and saying, Come on, think with me. Let's not do it this way because it ain't real. It is possible to love in word or talk, to have a kind of love that costs us nothing. Remember the story of the prodigal son, uh, rather the, the, the good Samaritan. Remember that story that Jesus told in Luke chapter 10. He speaks of an individual who had been beaten by robbers. The story is good. Left him half dead by the roadside. And the first person to pass by was the priest. And since it was the Jericho road, our understanding would be that either he was rushing to work from Jericho or he was going the other way around, knocking off from work going home. But whichever way it is, the point is, he sees this person, sort of uh, a, a mangled form of him by the roadside, he quickly moves to the other side of the road and continues. If he's going to work, it's simply, you know, you can delete these things. If he's not moved from work, it's, you know, I'm tired. I've worked so hard, I, I don't think I can take on anything else, I'm sure. Other people will be coming to help. I'm tired. The Levite does exactly the same thing. And then a Samaritan comes around. Now, uh, again, we need to understand the context as to why Jesus used the word Samaritan. It's, uh, the Samaritans and the Jews 
were in a relationship uh, of um, competition. It's uh, the kind of thing where if a Samaritan saw a Jew dying, the normal thing is, yeah, at least it would be one less of them. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good news. So the fact that this Samaritan did not do that, but instead he takes this person, puts him uh, on his donkey, takes him to an inn, uh, stays there with him, nurses him back to health, pays so that, because now he has to hurry on, that if there are any other bills, at least here is some extra money. Uh, and then challenges this, this guy who was trying to claim, you know, this, this thing is, you know, it's complex. It's, it's rather confusing, you know. Who's my neighbor? You, know, you can't tell. Who's your neighbor? He now says to him, fine, now tell me, between those three people, who, who, who was the neighbor to this, this man? And the answer was obvious. It was the good Samaritan. Because the priest may pray, the, the Levite may pray, but look, this guy needs concrete help. And you have the means. You can take him on your donkey and do what this fellow did. We can always get away with mere words, mere talk. There's a story told of a beggar who collapsed. And uh, when he collapsed, people crowded around him. And as usual, everybody's intelligent in such situations. Others were saying, you know, take off his shoes. And of course, the shoes were spitting dust. You know, take off his shoes there and his socks and so on. Others were saying, you know, he's got too many clothing on him. You know the way beggars are these days. Dirty vest inside, a dirty shirt, a dirty swine, a dirty coat, and so on. They put, even if it's in October. You know, to take those things uh, of him and so on and so forth. Uh, others were saying, you know, get a bucket and get some water and pour it over his head. And then there was an old lady that was saying, give him some beer. <laughs> so the beggar at that point opened his eyes when he heard the, the, the old lady's voice and said, everybody shut up and hear what this old lady is, is saying. <laughs> okay, now that's the joke, but I, that's not why I'm using it here. The, the point I'm trying to illustrate out of this is that, you know, everybody was wanting to help through what costs them nothing. You see, removing shoes doesn't cost you anything. Removing the coat, it doesn't cost you anything. Going to across the road with a bucket, pour, getting water, and pouring it on this beggar, doesn't cost you anything. It's the kind of thing people were willing to quickly do. Hey, let's do this. Hey, do this. Hey, do this. After all, it's not costing us anything. But, you know, you don't just walk across the road and pick up beer and give it to anybody. You know that. <laughs> beer costs something. No wonder the, the beggar said, listen to this. But that's the way we all are, isn't it? As long as it doesn't cost you anything, you're willing to help. And that's why it's so easy to say, I'll pray for you. Because it won't cost you anything. In fact, for most of us, we don't even pray after we've said, I'll pray for you. We don't even pray. It's a way of saying, ah, you know, get out of my hair. You know, I need to, to move on. But even if someone will say, hey, I'll pray for you, my question is often, why pray when the answer is in your pocket? Why pray? Eh? Someone needs accommodation, I'll pray for you. Uh -uh. But there's a room in your home. Why go and pray? Are you expecting a house to fall from heaven? We have the means. God has given them to us. So when you are in membership in a church, believe you me, 
God is giving you a testing ground to see whether your claim to Christianity is real. Are you actively and practically loving fellow members? Are you? Not in terms of, you know, they ask, but because the situation is opening up. Either you've seen or you've heard. Are you actively doing something about it? Are you? Now remember, these are tests of salvation that we're looking at here. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 9, Chapter 2 and verse 9, this is the way it was put. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. And we need to stop seeing hatred as the way I defined it earlier on, the extreme end, where someone actually even injures you and you say, yes, now this is proof that somebody hurts because he's been going around with a grudge and finally takes a, a knife, as it were, and puts it through your ribs. Yes, that is an extreme. But be blessed with the world's goods and then there is a person who is in need and you still refuse, you close your heart, you turn away from that person. God is saying that is equally hateful. It's hatred. And especially if you claim to be that person's brother, you claim to be that person's sister, you claim to be in the same spiritual family. It's hatred. And it is evidence that you are not a Christian. It's evidence. I keep quoting this verse because it speaks about the end. Maybe I'll just read it to you. But what I want you to notice there is that it is a sin of omission. It is a sin of omission. And these guys get punished for it. Here it is. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And this is Jesus talking about himself in the coming day. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger. You welcomed me in. I was naked. You clothed me. I was sick. You visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. You would have thought that this is now Jesus teaching a salvation by works. You would say, well, look, that's, that's not how people get saved. It's not by works. It's by faith, by faith alone. Jesus should have said, come, you are blessed by my Father, come in. Because you repeated the sinner's prayer, come in. You answered an altar call, come in. You cried, Jesus save me, come in. But look at what he's referring to. Why is he referring to this? It's because it's the proof of your salvation. I saw the evidence that I had really saved you. Now, of course, they were surprised because, I mean, if, if Jesus was to come in here and say, you know, I, I, I need uh, 
a night at a very expensive hotel tonight. We would all say, no problem, no problem. You know, here's the money. All of us would be falling over each other to give him that money so that he spends the night in Pamozi Hotel. But this is the way he puts it in verse 36. Sorry, verse 38. Uh, 37. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And then when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these bro my brothers, you did it to me. When you were within the context of the church and these useless Christians, I'm using the word useless in the sense that they're not likely to benefit you or re repay you the favor. You know what I mean? Usually if it's a dutiful sister in the Lord who just coughs a little, the brothers in the Lord all run to the nearest pharmacy to go and bring cough mixture. You okay? Because, you know, there, there's a benefit they might get afterwards. That's not the situation I have in mind. It's, he's saying, you know, the fact that it was simply a brother or a sister in the Lord. When you did it for the least of these, the least of these, the one who hardly ever will return the favor, you were doing it for me. But listen to the other side quickly. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry. And what I want you to notice again there is exactly the illustration of what John is talking about. You're seeing a need, you do nothing about it. In other words, it's a sin of omission. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. In other words, you hated me. You saw my need, it went the other way, continued your own life leaving me in my need as if you are not my brother, as if you are not my sister. And then they will also say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then you will answer them, truly I said to you, as you did not do it for one of the least of these, these my brothers, these my sisters, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment. So clearly, in God's eyes, it's hatred. When he gives you something and you don't use it to minister to those whom you are seeing and you are hearing that they are in need and they're in the context of the body of Christ. It is a litmus paper test. And that's why he puts you in the church. He, he's seeing your reactions. He's seeing. He's seeing whether you still simply cling on to those who you know are your buddies and they will bless you back. He sees. He sees when information comes to you or you see the needs yourself and it's that sort of useless guy and you just look the other way. He sees and he's saying that's definitely proof, living proof that I will use on the judgment day that this person was not saved by me. Sinner. So I close by saying if Jesus has truly saved you, God's love for his people will flow out of you. It will flow naturally. You will love. I want to assure you of that. You will love. You'll want to know them. You want to know their circumstances. 
you will want to do. Not because you are forced, you will want to do it. As soon as you know the, of this need, your mind goes to your home or your bank account or your fridge or wherever it might be, your mind goes there and you say, come to think of it. Yes, I do have space here. Yes, I do have food here. Yes, I do have that jacket or that trousers or that shirt or that dress that I, I've hardly been putting on these days. Yes, it looks like it's the same size. Yes, and so on. Your mind quickly goes through that and you begin to work on it. That's you. Your heart is full of the love of God. You know that that brother or that sister, you live in the same area. Then why should I be going to church with an empty car? Why? You live in the same area. I can see the need. I'm going to say, look, I've got space. Let's just agree. This time, find you here, pick you up, we go to church together. Super. Come back, drop you off. You even asked, but I can see you're my brother, you're my sister. Let's work on this together. But if you lack that love, don't pretend. Because that's when it is simply loving in word or talk. Don't pretend. I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Don't pretend. Instead, go to Christ and say to him, Lord, I can see from this that I'm still very self-centered and very selfish. I can see. Please, Lord, save me. Please, Lord, change me. Please, Lord, put your love in my heart that I may love others. I want to ask you, judging from the last one week, maybe the last one month, because there are plenty of needs here, I can assure you, plenty of them. Has your world good been blessing those who are in need? I leave it to you to think. Amen.